Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Emily Sanford. I'm a grad student here in the Cool Worlds Lab. Um, and I'm here to tell you about something a little different today. This is an idea I've been working on with Zephyr Benoyer, who is a grad student at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and it's a very exciting idea, um, but it's pretty far outside my wheelhouse. Uh, and the implications of it actually make me quite nervous. Um, and so the tone of this video might end up being a little bit more serious than my previous contributions to the channel. So the idea is a lunar space elevator. It's a long, thin cable. It's anchored at one end to the moon, and the other end hangs down towards Earth, and it ends somewhere above geostationary orbit height, so maybe roughly 100,000 kilometers above Earth's surface. I found this extremely difficult to visualize when Zephyr and I first started working on it, so let me show you a picture of the Earth-Moon system to scale uh, so it's easier for you to see what I'm describing. So this picture amazes me even knowing in advance all of the numbers involved. I mean, you have the moon, which is roughly a quarter of the diameter of Earth, and that's not too surprising. But the distance between them is like 30 Earth diameters. Space is upsettingly big. So now we have this picture, uh, and let's talk about the physics going on here. And specifically, let's talk about the forces and accelerations we would need to keep track of if we were going to build something in between the Earth and the moon. So luckily, we're talking about spherical bodies in a vacuum, which is kind of a physicist's one true flame. So this isn't going to be too complicated. We have Earth exerting a gravitational force to the left in this picture, and the Moon exerting a gravitational force to the right. And somewhere in between them, there's going to be a point where those forces balance and cancel out. And since Earth is so much heavier than the Moon, that point is actually going to be closer to the Moon. And that point is called the first Lagrange point, or L1. So now let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine that we're hanging out at L1 in a spaceship. Remember that means that the gravitational forces that we're feeling from Earth and the Moon are balanced. They're canceling out. And let's remember also that L1 moves with the Moon's orbital motion, but we're going to keep up with L1. We're going to kind of match the motion of the Moon. And let's imagine that in our spaceship we have a spool of cable. So if we take the two ends of this cable and we start paying them out very carefully, one end towards Earth and one end towards the Moon, we can maintain this gravitational balance that we started with. We have to pay out kind of more cable in the Earthward direction but if we do it right, the gravity tugging on the Earthward end and on the Moonward end will continue to cancel out, and we'll stay at L1. So eventually, if we continue to pay out the cable in both directions, the Moonward end is going to touch the surface of the Moon, and then we can anchor it there. And we note that the anchor point isn't under all that much stress, because the force balance we constructed at the beginning is still happening. The other end will be free-floating in space, somewhere above Earth, or in our picture, somewhere to the right of Earth. So now that we've built the anchor on the moonward side, we can actually continue paying out cable towards Earth kind of as long as we like. Eventually, we will get to a point where the gravitational force from Earth is strong enough to snap the cable or break the anchor. Or alternatively, we might get down to geostationary orbit height, which is full of satellites we don't want to disturb. So we would stop before those points. So that's it. That's the lunar space elevator. And the idea is that once it's in place, uh, it makes travel between Earth and the Moon much more efficient because you no longer have to expend enough rocket fuel to get yourself all the way to the Moon. Uh, rather, you only need to expend enough fuel to rendezvous with the Earthward end of the cable. It would actually reduce the net fuel cost of traveling from Earth to the Moon by about two-thirds, which is pretty amazing given that it's not even addressing the most fuel-expensive part of that journey, which is getting off of Earth in the first place. So before I go on to talk about the implications of this idea, I just want to note a couple of potential sources of confusion um, and a couple of things that it's important to remember about the Earth-Moon setup. So the first is that the Moon is tidally locked to Earth. And what that means is that we're always seeing the same hemisphere of the Moon, no matter what phase it's in. So if this is Earth uh, and this is the Moon, let's say that this side with the logo on it is the one that's pointing towards Earth. That's always pointing towards Earth, no matter what phase the Moon is in. So we're not ever seeing the back side of the moon, as it were. And that's really important for the lunar space elevator because it means that the cable can't wind itself up. It's always going to be pointing straight towards Earth. So the second potentially confusing thing that I don't want anyone to get caught up on, I've glossed over a centrifugal force term in our force balance equation that happens because the whole cable is co-rotating with the moon. That term is small compared to the gravitational forces, so we can kind of safely ignore it for the purposes of this video. So I also just want to note a couple of illuminating principles to kind of keep in the back of your mind as you're thinking about this for the first time. Because uh, nothing about it is intuitive, and it's a lot to take on board all at once, especially if you're not used to thinking about orbits. 
So the first thing to keep in mind is that motion through space as we usually think of it, which is motion in a rocket ship, is very different from motion along the lunar space elevator. And the reason for that is that rocket ships aren't propelling themselves along by like friction of wheels on a road. They're propelling themselves along purely by conservation of momentum. What they're doing is taking rocket fuel and expelling it at high velocity in one direction. And then just by conservation of momentum, the rocket is propelled in the other direction. So when rockets speed up or slow down or change direction, that's how they're accomplishing it. Uh, and this is a very costly way to move around because you have to expel fuel to make it happen. And that means that you need to have fuel up in space to expel. Like all of the fuel you're going to use for all of your rocket motion needs to be lifted off of Earth with you. That's very expensive. So in contrast with that sort of rocket motion, moving along the lunar space elevator is just like moving along any other elevator cable. You can power with solar panels. And so once you've rendezvoused with the lunar space elevator, you can then kind of travel anywhere along the lunar space elevator for free in spaceflight terms. You don't need to expend any more fuel to get anywhere along the cable. The second thing to keep in mind is that orbits are not obvious and it takes a long time to build up intuition about the relative motion of objects in space. And if you're interested in the mathematics of why the lunar space elevator makes travel between the Earth and the Moon more efficient, uh, I'd recommend checking out Appendix B of my paper with Zephyr, the link will be below. But more generally, if you're interested in developing an intuition for orbital motion, I'd recommend playing around in Kerbal Space Program. It's a really good and fun way to build up those intuitions. Okay, so that's the Lunar Space Elevator. Um, having explained what it is and how it works, I want to talk about it from a few different angles. Uh, first, I want to talk about it as an idea or an invention, uh, and then I want to move on to talking about it as a mathematical or physical object. Uh, and lastly, I want to talk about it as a practical proposition. So first I want to talk about the lunar space elevator as an idea or a kind of invention. And many of you watching this video will have been thinking throughout how the lunar space elevator is clearly related to the classic space elevator. And that's a proposal where, again, you have a long cable, but this time one end of it is anchored to Earth's surface on the equator, and the other end is anchored to a counterweight that lives out in space, out past geostationary orbit. And the whole thing is supported by the centrifugal force as Earth rotates around. And this is a really attractive idea because it's attached to Earth, and it means that you could actually climb your way into space along this elevator. Unfortunately, we don't have materials that are strong enough to build this thing at this point, so it's a sort of medium-term future proposition. Uh, but the lunar space elevator is clearly related to the classic space elevator. But even the lunar space elevator, which is the specific thing I'm describing in this video, uh, has actually been independently invented at least two other times that I know of before Zephyr thought of it last year and before we started working on it. In particular, I wanna point you to the work of Jerome Pearson, who first published about it in 1979, and then also to the work of Marshall Eubanks and Charles Radley, who are now part of the Liftport group, led by Michael Lane, and they're working on it really hard right now. The so Liftport, in particular, um, have thought very, very deeply about all of the engineering and space flight concerns uh, involved in actually constructing a lunar space elevator. And Michael Lane and Charles Radley have been really enthusiastic and very generous in sharing their work with us uh, since we discovered we had this idea in common. So you'll find links to all of their work and to the Liftport website uh, below in the description. So that's the lunar space elevator as an idea, certainly not original to us, but independently discussed which is really cool that different groups have had this idea over time and worked on it. And now I want to move on to talking about the lunar space elevator as a mathematical and physical object. So Zephyr and I were really interested in the lunar space elevator initially uh, as a sort of physics homework problem. It's a really fascinating setup. You have a long, flexible tether. It's spanning two gravitational potential wells. It's a perfect laboratory in some ways for thinking about gravity and about orbits and even about the moon. I've learned a lot about the moon <laughs> working on this project. This project has also been a really cool chance to think about what interesting science and engineering you can do with easier access to the moon. Uh, or even more excitingly, easier access to the Lagrange point, L1. So you can use the lunar space elevator to get out to L1. And then once you're there, you can imagine uh, building much more ambitious and much larger structures in space than we can build, uh, for example, in low Earth orbit. And the reason for that is, is simple. It's just that things in low Earth orbit are moving very quickly. And if two objects end up on slightly different orbits, they're going to move apart from each other very fast. So if you're bolting together two halves of the International Space Station and you drop your power tools, um, 
they're, they're gone. You're not going to get them back. They're flying away from you. But at L1, if you drop something, it's going to stay nearby. Things don't move apart nearly so quickly. And this could be fantastic for constructing large space telescopes, large mirror panels, um, even something as big as an Antarctic research base, but at L1. So it's a cool thing to think about. So that brings me to my third point, which is discussion of the lunar space elevator as a practical proposal, something we could imagine doing for real. And over the past couple of days, as I've kind of started to think about this video, I've really been struggling to put my thoughts about this to paper. Uh, and it's been something of a minor crisis of conscience, actually. Um, and I'm speaking only for myself now. I'm not speaking for Zephyr, and I'm certainly not speaking for anyone who's working on the lunar space elevator otherwise. Because here's the thing about the lunar space elevator. Um, as these sort of batshit, futuristic, spacefaring proposals go, this one is really uh, very doable um, already. <laughs> like, not even in the near future, like, already, already. There are still lots of important calculations and checks we need to do. We need to make sure it would survive meteorite impacts. We need to make sure there's stability considerations I haven't gone into here. But it's not like the classic space elevator where we're waiting around for carbon nanotubes to advance. With the lunar space elevator, the idea exists and the materials exist. So as someone who went into astronomy, which is maybe the least practical of all of the sciences, <laughs> Um, the idea that something I contributed to intellectually in this way could be built in the real world um, is pretty unsettling um, and pretty distressing. Because the lunar space elevator could be built as the result of an international scientific and diplomatic collaboration, or it could be built in service of American military hegemony, or it could be built as Elon Musk's space driveway to his space mansion at L1. Um, you know, I'm being facetious a little bit, but I'm also, I'm not wrong. And similarly, it could be used to collect solar energy really efficiently. It could be used to build these phenomenal scientific tools, space telescopes, research stations. It could even be used to build a, a sunshade uh, if it turns out we've destroyed the climate enough that that's a necessary kind of stopgap, last-ditch, temporary measure. Or... It could open up new spacefaring economies so quickly that we kind of increase the number of rocket launches every year by orders of magnitude, and we torch the climate even faster than we already are. Um, there's a lot of different directions this could go. So my point is just that all of these possibilities are possible, and they're not mutually exclusive, um, and they're not easily predictable. So it frankly really freaks me out that someone like an Elon Musk or a Jeff Bezos or a Richard Branson could decide to build one of these with no democratic oversight, possibly before anyone really realized what was happening. We've seen similar things happening already with Elon Musk's Starlink satellites. Uh, Zephyr and I even already have some regrets about the way that we framed this idea in the first public version of our paper about it, um, which we're revising right now. Uh, we called it the space line instead of the lunar space elevator. It's kind of a zippy, appy kind of name. You know, we didn't include any strong ethical appeals along the lines of, of how I'm speaking to you now. I think those things were mistakes. And I think it's very easy to get caught up in either the, the cool futuristic or technological implications of an idea like this or in just thinking about it as a cool physics problem. But when it's a realistic proposition and not just a hypothetical, that's not good enough. It's a very cool idea. It has a lot of interesting implications and a lot of really interesting possibilities could arise from it, but it's also dangerous and we shouldn't let it sneak up on us. Um, and that's why I'm here talking to you now. I want you to take this idea with you. I want you to think through these possibilities. Um, and I want you to realize that the question of whether to build things along these lines isn't some distant future hypothetical anymore. It's here. It's now. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. 